Hello and thanks for listening. Uh, my name is Alberto Garcia. I work for Igalia on the QME project. And in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the work that I have been doing lately. And this is related to the QCode 2 file format. As you know, this is the native file format used by QMU and it supports many features as encryption, compression, uh, backing files, etc. But the, the question that I'm going to try to answer today is why is it that sometimes it is uh, slower than a raw file? There's many reasons for that. It can be because it hasn't been configured correctly, we're not using the right options for our setup. Of course, it can be that QMU, uh, the driver can be improved, and so there's uh, still room for improvement there. Um, three years ago in the KVM forum 2017, I was uh, talking about these things, so you can check the, the talk, it's in YouTube, it's available. Um, but today I want to focus on the problems that are a result of the very design of the QCO2 file format. So let's start with the format itself, how, how it works. Uh, the basic idea of the, the QCO2 file it is, it is divided into clusters of the same size. 64K by default, but it, it can be changed when the file is created from 512 bytes to up to 2 megabytes. There are different cluster sizes, I'm not going to go into the details now, but Let's focus on the data cluster, which contains the, the data that the guest can see. So every time the guest uh, needs to read data, it goes to the QCO2 file. If the, the data, if the cluster has been allocated there, then it just reads the data for the cluster. But if the cluster hasn't been allocated, then the, it contains zeros. Or if there's a backend file, it goes to the backend file and checks the data is there. So. The cluster is the smallest unit of allocation, so every time we allocate a new cluster, if the write request is smaller than the cluster size, then we need to fill the, the rest with data. And the data means we either go to the backend file and get it from there, so in the case of in this uh, image that you see, if we write to the area in pink, we would need to go to the backend file and read the, the areas in dark blue and copy them to the active file. Or if there's no backend file, we just fill it with zeros, but we still need to fill it. Uh, so the problem is that, of course, QEMU needs to perform additional I.O. to copy the rest of the data. So the copy and write is an, can be an expensive operation. As you can imagine, the, when we increase the cluster size, we have to do more copy and write, so the performance goes down. You can see that in the table. I have to mention, though, that if you don't have a backing file, then, as I said, we should fill the, uh, the cluster with zeros, but QEMU nowadays uses F allocate to try to, to fill it in a more efficient way. So if that works, if the file system supports it and the operating system supports it, this is very fast and then the cluster size doesn't have any effect. But if that doesn't work, then it goes to the slow path of writing actual zeros to disk and then you can see the numbers that I'm showing in the table. If there's a backend file, however, there's no, no alternative. We need to go to the backend file and get the data from there. So that's, that's where the, the cluster size has, has an effect. The other consequence of this is, of course, the larger the cluster size, we do more uh, I.O., we do more copy and write, and then the image uh, is bigger. Uh, you write the same data, but you get a bigger image in result because you are duplicating data from the backing file. How much? Well, this depends a lot on the use case. I'll uh, hear reports that uh, can be 30% larger or 40% larger, but it depends a lot on the, your use case. I was just doing a couple of uh, tests for this presentation, and you can see that if we have an empty image and we write 100 megabytes worth of uh, random 4K requests, the, the impact of having a, a, a larger cluster size is very big. We have a default 64K, we get a 1.6 gigabyte image, which is more than 10 times the, what we were trying to write, which is a lot. But if we go to the maximum cluster size, we get 29 gigabytes, which is 300 times the, the initial, the amount of data that we want to write, which is very big. Of course, this is an extreme case. Normally, in a real world scenario, we don't, we don't just write random write request. But it gives an idea of what the problem is. Um, then I, I did a second test. I took an empty one terabyte image and I created a file system there. And as you can see the file system itself, the metadata used by the file system, which is just, well, is 1.1 gigabyte. But if you increase the cluster size and you take it to the maximum, then you use one more gigabyte. Just for creating a file system, an empty file system with nothing else in it. So 
So, in summary, if we increase the cluster size, uh, we get less performance because there's additional I.O. that needs to be done. And we also get larger, larger images and duplicate data. So, the thing is clear, then why don't you just, just uh, reduce the cluster size, no? Problem is that it's not so easy, uh, because smaller clusters means more metadata and more clusters also. So, that, what does this mean? Apart from the guest that data itself, QCO2 images also need to store metadata about the, the cluster. So important things are the cluster mappings, which map the guest addresses to the host addresses, and the reference counts. Uh, all clusters in, in QCO2 have reference counts, and we're going to see later. So if we're going to have more clusters, we're going to have more of them. So it means more metadata. Uh, so the, the mapping from the guest clusters to the, the, the guest offsets to the host offsets uh, is done using this structure that we call L2 and, uh, L1 and L2 tables. This is a simple structure uh, that maps uh, uh, virtual offsets into host offsets. You can see an example here in this graphic. Um, the L1 table is just one per image, per snapshot actually, because the QGO2 format can have several snapshots, but we're not going to go into that now. But the table itself is very small. Uh, it's for a one terabyte image, it's just 16K, so it's, it's nothing. It's stored contiguously in the image file. And QM always keeps it in memory because it's very small, so it's not, there's not a problem with that. And basically, uh, the table just contains pointers to the L2 tables. The L2 tables, there can be many of them. And initially, there's none, but they, they are allocated in demand as the image grows. The L2 tables are always one cluster in size, uh, never more, never less. And they also contain basically good pointers to the, to the data clusters, plus some additional information that we're going to see later. Thing is that, of course, if we reduce the cluster size, then we need more entries. So graphically, we had two clusters, and we make the clusters uh, twice as small, then we're going to have four clusters, and we need four uh, entries this time. So uh, half the cluster size, twice the metadata. That's the basic idea. Um, here we see in the table what's the, the maximum metadata for a one terabyte image. Uh, as you see, if you reduce the cluster by size by half, you increase metadata by two, which is a very big uh, uh, difference, of course. So if choosing the right cluster size has a very big impact on the amount of metadata that would, uh, you have in the image. So what does this mean? Every time we need to uh, do a I/O request in the from the guest, QM needs to go to the L2 table and get the, the host offset. It needs to transform the guest offset into the host offset. So that's one additional I/O operation per request, and this is a, has a very big import, uh, impact in performance. So what QM does in order to minimize it is it keeps the L2 tables in memory. There's a queue go to cache, the L2 cache for that purpose. Uh, I was talking about about it in more detail in the previous presentation that I mentioned earlier. And it has a very big impact. If we increase the cluster size, we get much more performance. So in the case of in this example that you see here, the maximum uh, cache needs is five megabytes, and we get uh, forty thousand operations per second. But we, we reduce the cluster size, the cache size. Sorry, then the performance goes, goes down very quickly because it means that uh, there's no we need to go to disk to get the L2 metadata more often. So. Reducing the cluster size means uh, we have much more metadata and we have much more RAM that we need to keep that metadata in memory. Then there's the reference counts. Every cluster in a QCO2 image has a reference count. Uh, all types of clusters, not just data clusters. These are used, for example, for snapshots because you need to know who is using each one of the clusters. And they are stored in a two-level structure called reference table and reference block. It's very similar to the, the L1 and L2 tables that we just uh, described. So, of course, allocating new clusters has additional overhead because you need to update the reference counts. So, with smaller clusters, we need to allocate more of them. So, in general, we have a lot of small clusters. We need to allocate first more clusters. We need to allocate more L2 tables. We need to allocate more uh, reference blocks. And all that together means that the um, Although normally reducing the cluster size increases the performance because there's less copy and write involved, once we go uh, under a certain limit, in this example is less than 16K, the performance goes down very quickly. And as you can see, the performance when we have 4K clusters 
is horrible. Even though with 4K clusters there is no copy and write, but there's we have to allocate so many clusters, so many L2 tables, so many reference blocks that it's, the performance is very bad. So the situation so far is that we cannot have too big clusters because they they waste too much space and there's the additional I/O needed for a copy and write. And we cannot have two small clusters because they increase the amount of metadata. And if we decrease it too much, then it's also very bad uh, performance. And this is a direct consequence of the, the, the format itself. It's not something that you can fix in the driver. So what can we do about it? So the solution that I'm uh, describing in this presentation is uh, called a subcluster allocation. And the basic idea is that we have big clusters in order to reduce the amount of metadata. But each one of them is divided into subclusters uh, that can be allocated separately. So we have faster allocations and less uh, disk usage. So graphically, a normal uh, L2 table looks like this. We have two data clusters, as you can see. With subclusters, each one of the data clusters is divided into uh, 32 subclusters of uh, the same size. Um, they are allocated separately. So in this case, only the areas in blue are actually allocated and using space in disk. Uh, internally, the L2 table contains, as I said earlier, pointers to the data clusters. It basically, it looks like this. It's the cluster offset plus a few more bits that indicate whether the cluster is allocated or not, uh, is compressed or not, or it contains zeros. It contains zeros is a feature from QCO2 that means that the cluster doesn't have any other data other than zeros, so there's no need to go to the data cluster and read from there. We just, we just know that it's zeros and we can return zeros without doing the I.O. So if we have subclusters, we need to store additional information for that. And there's no space here. So we have uh, we added this extended L2 entries, which is basically very similar to the ones that we had before, but they contain an additional bitmap indicating the status of each subcluster. So with this, each one of the individual subclusters can be allocated, unallocated, or can be all zeros also. Um, compressed clusters don't have this, however. Compressed clusters uh, they cannot be divided into subclusters, and anyway, compressed clusters, uh, there doesn't really make so much sense to, to use compression with uh, extended L2 entries because there are different use cases. So the use cases that I see for subcluster allocation are two. One of them is having very large clusters because we want to minimize the amount of uh, metadata and the amount of memory that we that we need, but still want to have uh, good I/O and, and have smaller images. And the other use case is that we want to maximize the performance. So we want to have the, the keep the allocation unit as close as possible to the to the um, block uh, guest uh, block size. So we want to minimize the amount of uh, copy and write and get the maximum performance. So what does this mean? As I said, if we make the subcluster size equal to the request size, it means the the file size the file system block size, then we get the, there's no copy and write at all, and we get the maximum performance. We can see here that compared to the previous, to the default uh, setup without subclusters, in some cases we, we get 10 times more IO operations per second. And if we go to the cases where uh, the subcluster is 4K or less, which is the, the size of the request in this example, then we get the maximum performance, which is 12, 13K uh, IO operations per second. With a backing file, the relative differences are the same. Of course, it is faster because we don't need to go to the backing file to read the data. And again, I want to mention that uh, if the file system supports uh, emptying the cluster with f-allocate, then this uh, is going to be much faster than this. And then actually using subcluster doesn't really make a difference. It's not going to be faster with that. So you have to consider that. About the, the space, of course, if we have now the smaller allocation uh, uh, units, then the images grow uh, much less. So we compare uh, the random writes that I, that I mentioned before. We write 100 megabytes in, in 4K write requests. The end result is much, much smaller, as you can see in the, in the example. So, so of course, this is, uh, uh, improves a lot the, how we use the disk. And although L2 extend L2 entries are twice as large as normal L2 entries, we would, uh, in principle, it would use uh, more metadata. However, since each one of the L2 entries now points to 60, uh, 32 subclusters, 
The end result is that we have 16 times less metadata for the same unit of allocation. So we compare units of allocation clusters in traditional uh, L2 entries, um, subclusters in extended L2 entries. We see that for a 64K uh, cluster size, we would need uh, 128 uh, megabytes of uh, cache for a one terabyte image. But with extended end to entries, if we have 64K subclusters, we only need 8 megabytes, which is much less. So we can have much larger clusters and uh, give good performance and without uh, needing so much memory for the cache. So things that need to be taken into account. All, all this looks good, but this is not magic. So this feature is useful during allocation. Once the cluster is allocated, there's no uh, QCal2 works just fine with or without subclusters and you get good performance. So once the image is allocated, this is not going to really to help so much more. Um, again, with compressed, with compressed images, it doesn't make sense. I think it's a completely different use case. Uh, so this is not going to give you any benefit. You're going to have uh, twice as uh, much metadata and you're not going to see anything, uh, any benefit. And if your image doesn't have any backing file, maybe you don't see any speed up. As I said, QEMU tries first to uh, use F allocate to uh, allocate clusters efficiently. So you have to try that first to see if it helps in your scenario. But if you're using backing files, then it will help in any case. And then, of course, uh, images created with this extended L2 entries are not going to be uh, possible. You're not going to be able to read them with other versions of QMU. And I don't expect that this feature can be backported easily, so you will need the latest versions of QMU. So how do I try this? This is not available in QMU yet. It's not in any release. Uh, it will probably be available in QMU 5.2, but the feature is complete and it's already in the repository and you can test it already. So you just download the latest uh, version from Git. Uh, you compile it and you create an image with uh, the option extended L2 enabled. And that's all. You also probably want to have a, a larger cluster size. The default cluster size is 64K, but with this feature, it makes sense to use uh, larger clusters, so be sure to try those. But that's all that you need to do. There's no nothing else. Uh, again, feedback, back reports, etc., are very much appreciated. This feature is complete, but it's new, so any testing, anything that you try, suggestions, etc., we will be happy to hear about them. You can write to the mailing list, or you can contact me directly. And that's basically it. I would also like to take the opportunity to thank Outscale, which is the company that is sponsoring all my work in QMU and in this feature in particular. So everything that you are seeing here today is thanks to their sponsoring. And this is all. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and I'm open to any questions. Thank you.